So when I pitched the idea to talk about the churn tools we use at T-Mobile, I thought about just showing the tools. But then I re realized not everyone may know about churn and about survival and about all those things. And so what you see today is a combination of a primer on churn and my approach to implement this in Tableau. Uh, not as a dashboard so much, but more uh, as an analytical tool. And uh, by show of hands, um, who here works as an analyst with data? Okay. Who works uh, like an engineer with the data? A few less, okay. Okay. So um, in May 2019, the New York Times reported 4 million uh, paid subscribers, both print and digital. And they set a goal of 10 million paid subscriptions by 2025. That is 6 million in six years. So 1 million in one year, 250 in a quarter, and then per day, approximately 2,800 customers that they need to gain in order to hit that goal of 6 million uh, gains. The artic article doesn't mention anything about how many they lose per day, though. And so if they lose, for example, another 200 or 300, they need to gain those in addition to that. In in May of 2019, uh, Netflix, um, for the second quarter, uh, reported 60 million members, paid members in the US alone, and 130 paid net additions. So net additions are usually the denomination, de are denominate, denominated the difference, or denominate the difference between the activations and the drops. So in Q2, Netflix actually lost more customers um, than they gained. Uh, that's not a big problem in the grand scheme of things, since uh, they outpace it uh, with their international growth. T-Mobile has a pretty sig significant uh, track record on churn. When I came over from Deutsche Telekom almost nine years ago to join T-Mobile, and I think by now you realize that English is not my first language, right? <laughs> um, then uh, our churn was relative high. Uh, since then, uh, we improved our churn to another low in Q3 of 2019 at uh, 0.89%, down 13 basis points from last year. And that is a pretty huge improvement. So why should you care and focus on churn? Um, I showed a newspaper, I showed a streaming service, I showed a wireless provider. They all grapple with base management, basically. So if you're in a subscriber-based business, looking into churn, how to work with churn um, and uh, come up with ideas to, to, um, to reduce churn is something you should focus to. Imagine this example. You have 10 million uh, subscribers on your base and you have a monthly churn rate of 1%. That is 100,000 deactivations or drops or cancellations of your service in that month. Now imagine that the average revenue you, uh, you gain from those customers per month is $10, right? Then you lose $1 million every month because of, your, uh, because of, the, um, because of the churn of 1% in this example. Now, imagine you can shave off five basis points. Um, you can improve by, uh, five basis points to 0.95% um, uh, uh, your churn, right? With the same base at that time, you only lose, well only, lose 95,000 customers, so you save 5,000 customers. Translated into the, into the uh, dollar amount here, um, you actually gain or save revenue of 50,000 per month, right? And so this is a pretty impressive um, way to, to reduce churn and actually impact the bottom line immediately. And that's why I find, find churn analysis so exciting. Um, a small change in rate has immediate impact on your bottom line. Um, and it's ubiquitous. As I said, uh, you find it in newspapers, you find it at a streaming service, you find it at a music streaming service, you find it at software as a, as a service. Um, you could look at podcasts or at, um, at membership. Um, it's all, um, uh, it, you find it everywhere. Uh, base management is something that you, you find, uh, that, that, that you find everywhere. Um, it's also cross-functional. Um, you, you work with a lot of uh, smart people. Um, I'm in uh, performance analytics uh, at uh, T-Mobile. We work closely with people in finance, with closely with people in our stores, in retail, and we work closely 
uh, with, uh, with our engineering people to understand uh, where we should um, improve our, our network. Um, it is creative as well as uh, analytical, so you use your left side and your right side of the brain. Um, and, uh, well, it's a lot of data. Imagine just the number of customers we have um, and then all the dimensionality with that. And there's nothing new I tell you about that, I guess. Um, and we found tools. Um, in the past, all the tools I show you um, going forward were developed in Excel. And, uh, well, with, uh, with Tableau, we can actually uh, pull all this data into Tableau and do our analysis on survival, on churn, on hazard curves via these tools. So what are the tools we deploy? Um, first of all, there are the, the usual five plus one questions, right? It's the when, who, where, what, and why. And then obviously, when it comes to churn, how many, right? Um, so first to answer the question um, on when is we look at survival and hazard curves, and uh, we look at uh, seasonality. We do time series analysis and find out what is, is there a seasonality in the data depending on, on different dimensions like device types or rate bands or uh, you have it. The next one is uh, customer segmentation and profiling. We do distribution and mix analysis, something I will show later on as well, where we look at uh, how does the rate change and how does um, the, 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 the new customers that come into the base impact actually uh, the total rate in churn as an example. Um, we look at uh, where do we lose those customers, right? We do spatial analysis, um, which market, uh, I recently did an ana analysis on what is the improvement, what is the impact on tower upgrades to churn, right? And therefore we look at, well, spatial data and, and get this information. Uh, we analyze the what. That is, uh, that is like a product like postpaid versus prepaid, uh, phone versus tablet, things like that. And then we look at correlation um, and, uh, and relationships of the, of the dimensions um, to get to what, okay, what is the why here, right? And lastly, as already mentioned, we look at volumes, we look at rates, we look at period over period comparisons um, and, uh, and deviations on that. So how does churn relate to survival? Um, since I'm going to present survival analysis, I thought, well, I started with churn, but I want to show you something about survival, so how do they connect, right? So imagine going back to the 1% one monthly churn uh, over 36 months, there are formulas for that that you can actually use to determine what is the survival after 36 months. Um, and it's that. It's one minus churn uh, to the power of the months that you're looking, or days, or whatever it is, right? So you can say that if you have a 1% monthly churn, you look at uh, how many do survive, you find that 70% of the customers that you gained at a certain point in time are the ones that are remain after 36 months, right? And the inverse, well, you can do the math, so inversely you can use, uh, calculate the churn. If you have a survival of 70%, then um, uh, you, um, you look at 36 months and then you can go back and say, okay, this is, this is the, um, the, the equivalent of 1% monthly churn. So what, uh, what does the survival curve tell us? Well, it's a plane curve, right? A plane, well, line, basically. So let's look at it closer. Uh, the vertical axis um, has the survival rate. So it goes from 0 to 100 or 75. In Thindex example, I think 75 to 100. Um, and um, uh, the horizontal axis shows the tenure. So tenure is a pretty significant uh, determinant in, within uh, survival calculations. It determines um, the it is the, uh, they defined as the day of cancellation minus the day of when they signed up. So you have uh, a survival at day 90 means they stayed with you 90 days, three months basically, right? Um, so you want to always want to calculate the tenure of that. And then you go back in time and you look at, okay, in this example, survival on day 90 is 92%, so eight out of 100 customers have left you. Survival on day uh, 60 is 94% and so on. So you can actually look at those curves this is an aggregated curve. You will see uh, a, a, a disaggregated curve later on, but you can compare products. You can compare uh, different promotions um, with that uh, very easily. Um, so what else can we infer from survival curves? Um, and I think not only the line is interesting, but also the pattern of that. So um, imagine um, your favorite TV show, right? And uh, the hundred percent are the customers that signed up at the launch of a season, uh, and um, 
then you look at their survival over time, and you find that at the end of a sea, at, the, at the end of an episode, maybe people drop their service; they just cancel because they don't like this, the, the show anymore or any other reason, right? And so you find this curve as a step curve until the end of the um, uh, of the season, basically. Um, maybe at the end it's a little steeper, uh, but this gives you a good idea of how a survival curve uh, for a TV show would look like. This session. I mean, the ideal way is you have 100% till 4 o'clock, and then I'm done, and then you leave. But I imagine it's more closely to something like that, when people have to run to different, uh, different sessions already, that uh, they will, be leave, will leave a little earlier. And then um, uh, pop songs. Uh, the Economist recently uh, wrote about a streaming service and showed that if the chorus doesn't occur within the first 30 seconds, um, people skip the song. And so you can actually look at that and compare the tenure or the survival of pop songs and, and do some analysis on that and then determine what are the songs that, 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 um, are, that people listen to more often. And so we can use that to compare survival curves or evaluate the health of our product. So an, a dashboard that, well, not a dashboard, but an analytical tool that I developed was um, how do we explore that, that type of survival? So imagine these are all this is activation cords, and since all this data, while well, would be sensitive, this is all randomized data, so you don't see real patterns in here. Usually, you would see probably a Saturday, Sunday spikes and things like that. But this is randomized data. But we use that and show the all activation cohort, and then you can filter use an activation cord as a context filter, and then this um, this brings you to uh, brings you the shows you the survival curve basically over time, and then the disaggregated survival curve where you show each separate day uh, on, that, uh, on that dashboard, basically. And so you can look at, okay, there are differences in the size of the, of the line, but also differences in survival, depending on when customers signed up. And that is something that is pretty powerful as a tool when you look at, oh, we signed customers up, I don't know, on a certain day, and the, the mix of those customers is something that, that leads to them to leave at an er earlier than other, other groups. And then we look at the twin brother, and I'll, I'll go into that a little more in detail later on, which is the hazard curve, which is the number of customers you leave, uh, that leave you at the day, uh, so at day 90, a certain number of customers that, that, that drop and leave. And then we show that as a, as a cumulative. And you see that if you have those spikes, uh, as, I, as you can see here, this is the equivalent of the little blip here, and that is the equivalent of that um, uh, trend change up there. So there is, they're all related. Hazard, survival, churn, all related. So how do we calculate survival curves, right? It's pretty straightforward and you probably have figured that out already. Um, so the first uh, approach is uh, pretty straightforward. You show all the activations on day zero and you show the churners on the subsequent days. And I say churners because I'm working in churn, but if you work on something uh, that doesn't have churners but uh, drops or levers or however you want to call it, then, well, you put that in there, right? So you show that, then you subtract the churns from the previous value. So in this example, uh, the, three, the 100 minus 3 is the 97, 100, uh, 97 minus 2 is 95, and so on and so on. You do this for cohort 2, cohort 3, and so on. And then finally, you divide each value by the initial value. So in this example, here, the 97 by the 100 gives you the 97% here. The 83 divided by 90 gives you 92 here. The 102 by 110 gives you 93 here, and so on. And so you get all those different cohorts dependent on the activation cohort um, for each of those, uh, of those. And this is the, well, these are basically, you need three calculated fields for that, right? So you, you have the total sum of your, your subs or your activations. Uh, you have, a, well, the table, well, you have to calculate the table across. You have your first, if it's zero, then you take the total num number of customers that signed up, and um, un otherwise you just look, take, look the previous value, and then you have the division, the survival rate, surviving curve divided by the beginning cohort. So as shown in the dashboard, we also show survival by day, right? So this, as I said, this comes in handy. So you can look at, uh, you can look at the survival rate, the tenure, and then um, we move the activation date to the, uh, on color, and the beginning cord and size. And so then this tells you that maybe this one here has a, had, had more customers activating, but they also had more customers leaving because their survival is lower than all the other ones. So 
how do we read a hazard curve? I already talked that said that the hazard curve is kind of the twin brother of survival. So uh, it's calculated in a similar manner. Uh, it shows the rate at which the customer has left on a specific day, right? So in this example, you would see the hazard rate on day 90 is here 1%, so one out of 100 subscribers have stopped service, and here it's 2%, here it's 2%, and here it's whatever it is. So you see that this pattern tells you pretty, uh, pretty well uh, when customers leave. And going back to the example from earlier, what do you think a hazard curve would look like for the TV show? Well, you would see the corresponding spikes here that are getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and then probably here a little higher spike at the end when people drop because the season is over. Or for this session, it was something like that where no one leaves, no one leaves, no one leaves, five minutes to four, and people leave. Or for the pop song, a similar thing. Uh, it's just this one goes high up, high up, and so on. So how do we calculate hazard curves? Again, pretty straightforward, right? We start with the same activation cohort, and then we just divide each activation by the initial value. So here you have the three divided by, the, well, here you go. So the three divided by the 100 is the 3%, two divided by 100 is 2%, five divided by, and so on. And then you do this for all the other cohorts, and then you put this, this into your into your dashboard so that, um, that it, sh it shows you the hazard curve, either aggregated or for each cohort separately. But what we find very often is, although there are different activation days or cohorts, um, at, at, at the end, they all have a similar trajectory that they spike at certain times, right? Um, so how do we use this? We use it to estimate actually volume uh, with hazard curves. So in the example of the, of the New York Times early on, um, we actually have this tool here where you, you look at, okay, you enter a daily run rate for the plant promotion. You look at the duration in days. So in this example, 90 days, three months. Then um, uh, that returns the expected volume. So it's just the one multiplied with the other. And then you, the hazard curve then actually tells you how many customers you lose after 90 days, right? So you, can, you already know, you can use that tool to actually say, well, we do all this promotion, but at the end, we only get 217,000 customers instead of the 225 that we expected to have. And another question we asked, and then, so this, this is survival and hazard, but when you compare survival to something in the past, to a survival, to a cohort that, that was, uh, I don't know, a, a year ago, the question comes up, is there, is there seasonality in that type of survival, right? So what we do here is, and you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, seasonality everywhere, right? You find it in, as a monthly seasonality uh, on device launches or season releases. You find it as a daily uh, on sales data, uh, on store visits, uh, things like that. You find it hourly on call volumes or on web access. Um, so we look, uh, we, we try to use a time series analysis. And I learned yesterday, I think, uh, that Tableau Prep will allow R integration and, um, and Python integration. Uh, and uh, so maybe in the future, I don't need this R connection here. So again, we have uh, randomized data here. So the question is, how do we use that? So what I do here is we apply time series analysis to the data. Uh, I throw in the churn rate as one example. This returns, uh, this returns in this example, for example, 2.8 million for December 2017. Um, and we set it up uh, just a plain, uh, well, uh, calculated field again. So we install and load the R packages, and these are the ones that needed to be loaded. Make sure the R server is active. And then we create four different, different calculated fields for each of the components. So the data is your input, right? And then you want to look at the trend, the seasonality, and the remainder. And uh, the script is right here. Um, and uh, you want to change the, the one uh, to two or three or four, depending on what type of component you're interested in, right? You also want to make sure that the, your input data is either your volume or it's a rate, uh, depending on what you're looking at. Um, and then you want to make sure that you change the seasonality. In this example, I looked at a 12-month seasonality, but maybe you have uh, 52 weeks or um, daily seasonality and things like that. And you want to change, obviously, the, chart, uh, the, the start date. So what do, do we get out of that? So with three different table space or uh, charts, we get the trend component. In this example, it would tell us the trend at that day was 800,000. We get a seasonal component. And you see it, it, it repeats every, every time, right? So this is the same as here, as here, and so on. And then, um, and then we have, uh, so the seasonal component, this could be anything. So I, I mentioned uh, device launches, right? We know there are devices that get launched every year in September, right? We know there are other devices that get launched every year in March or April uh, time. Um, 
And uh, you find that also very often actually in your data. Um, and then you have a remainder, right? So you had your data, you detrended it, you deseasonalized it. The remainder is something that, well, either your competitors did or you did, right? And so you want to get an understanding of, okay, what are the things? So then you can look into the details of that and say, okay, what, what happened here? Is this a promotion that our competitors did? Is this something we did? And that's how we use, uh, that's, that's how we use that. And then we can think about, is there something we can do to actually break that trend uh, with one of the promotions, right? And so we use that for two things. We use it to estimate values and to develop plans, right? So in this example, we have the, uh, the volumes here, and then uh, I already showed that, so 800,000 trend, 700,000 seasonal component for December, and then 1.3 million in December, and that all adds up to the 2.8 million in December. Now, if you want to know what is, the, what is the expected value in December of this year, you go, the, you go bottoms up, basically, right? So you go back and say, well, okay, you make a logistic regression, you find, well, this, if, if I, if I um, forecast the trend, I get 1.9, I expect 1.9 million. I take the same seasonality because we're looking into December, right? And then you, you, you can either average the remainder or if you know there are promotions going on, then you actually can ladder that in and get a better understanding of, okay, maybe we have something, something here. And then you, you kind of come up with, okay, our expectations for the month of December in this case could be 3.3 million, right? Another thing is when we do, um, when we um, add uh, new customers, uh, the question is how do these new cohorts impact the churn um, performance, right? Um, and so imagine you ran a promotion and you gain customers in segment one and three, right? So this is going up, this is going up, but you lost some in your segment three. Uh, segment two, right? But overall, everything would fine. At the same time, your rate has changed and improved too. So, I mean, going down here is a good thing, right? Uh, so this churn uh, went down, this went up, this went down, total went down. So you see there were new customers coming in and the rate changed uh, differently. Now because of the, of the weighted uh, differences and the weighted averages, you'll find that you want to understand what is the contribution of each of the segments and what is driven by rate changes and what is driven by mix changes, right? So then you look at, uh, you look at, at that tool and this pops out, okay, if you have a change of a total of six basis points here, the rate and mix tool added together here by the rate and here by the mix gives you your mix change actually contributed seven basis points to the change of the rate, but the rate uh, 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 offset that a little bit because of those two changes within these segments. So you can look at those segments and say, oh, here's a healthy segment, here's a less healthy segment, what do we do about it, right? And so how do you set that up? Uh, very straightforward. Uh, you set up uh, the rate mix analysis, you create three temporary variables, and I don't want to go in this detail here because, uh, well, it's a little, well, you can read, so. <laughs> Um, and then, uh, how do you set up the rate mix analysis? So um, you create the output variables. Those are the variables that we show then in the table so that our business partners can take a look at that and, uh, and understand what, uh, what the data is. And so how do we use that? Uh, we have a, a little dashboard. This is the same table that I showed you earlier where we show the base volume and the rate per period by segment. And we show the partial and the total rate and mix contribution by segment in this example here. Then we have a little, well, a bar chart that actually then shows you what is the contribution of those three segments. Uh, we can identify healthy and at-risk segments, right? We can look at the at-risk segments. Uh, well, bad example is not here. Uh, but um, we can look at the at-risk segments, uh, customers who, who have left us, and we can uh, do an analysis and determine what are we going to do about that. And on the other hand, we look at, um, we look at the healthy um, segments and, um, and think about how can we get more customers in, into that segment because they may show, well, they show a better uh, survival already and a better churn number already. So if we get more customers like that, well, that's kind of beneficial, right? And so then we have a year-over-year -year comparison here. And we can use a period for year-over-year -year comparison or month-over-month -month comparison if you want to show how this changed over time. And so we use survival and hazard curves to, to determine the health of a promotion or of a product and use it to estimate the required volumes. We detrend and de-seasonalize volumes or rates to support a bottom-up plan of our future volumes. 
and we identify health or at risk segments to come up with ideas to retain those segments. And I mentioned earlier that we used to do all of these things in Excel because of the sheer volume uh, of data and dimensionality. We switched our, uh, recently to Tableau and, and use Tableau uh, not so much, well, we use it for dashboards as well, but we use it also for analytical um, uh, analysis. Um, and um, uh, as I said, recently we worked on some of the wares, so where should we um, upgrade towers in order to improve our churn. Uh, but I think that's something that is probably left for uh, TC20 next year. Um, so if you enjoyed uh, the presentation, please uh, uh, give me an um, evalua evaluation. And if you want to connect on uh, social, uh, you can find me on LinkedIn or on Twitter. And with that, I think I'll give you four minutes back. Thank you so much.